you could think of one thing you wish you knew when you were younger, like you wish that everybody kind of knew and got like, what's, well, there are a lot what of do things, you want to obviously look, Clearly, I wish I'd have bought Bitcoin, right? When I first heard about it, that was a key mistake. <laughs> That's the number one. That's awesome. I, no, but I mean, I, obviously, I mean, I, I mean, and, you know, I mean, I had, I mean. Welcome, welcome, welcome back, guys. You're looking at the Bitcoin chart and Bitcoin chart is flying, flying, flying. And that's not the only thing that's flying. We've got the good morning indicators. Every single one of those good morning indicators today is in the green. The Bitcoin price is up. The stock markets look good. The crypto market cap is good. The fear and greed index getting better. The grayscale premium going down. And every single one of the, the good morning indicators looking good today. So it should be a great day. And it's going to be a great show because this is the biggest show that crypto has ever seen. The biggest Friday banter that we have ever, ever, ever had. So if this is your first time here, welcome. Welcome to the biggest, best channel in crypto. Smash the like button, subscribe to our channel. Freddie, what do you say we get the show on the road? Let's do it. And we're gonna give away loads of cash today. Loads and loads of cash to be given away on the show as usual. Let's do it. And increases. Let's Mr. Wonderful it thinks it's worthless. Well, I, I he actually, called it garbage I, I this want morning. To explore the idea, yeah, I did say that. <laughs> I want to explore the idea that there is nothing here except raw speculation. Mm -hmm. No different than when I go to Las Vegas and put my money on black or red on a roulette wheel. Because where is the intrinsic value inherent in deploying real capital? Let's talk real mm -hmm. money here. And putting it into Bitcoin as a storage of value. I get gold. For 2,000 years, including the Romans, they saw value in, in, in owning that as an asset class. Tell me why this, which is basically a digital um, game, mm -hmm. that's the way I look at it, has any intrinsic value. When people actually put real money into this, they make no interest, they can't pay their taxes with it, the regulators don't like it, which is always a problem for compliance. And where's the long-term value? Just this this idea that they're going to cut the number of units in half? Sounds like such a scam. <laughs> like, that's just totally b... Okay, 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 okay. Every time I go anywhere to talk about crypto, I get that piece of video shoved up my you-know-what. Now, I just want to say something here to defend myself. When things change, I change, all right? I'm a pragmatic investor. 2017, I'll never forget, Pop never lets me live it down, that piece of tape. It's all over CNBC every day. The regulator was downright hostile. They were absolutely vicious on all the tokens that were coming around, monetizing hotels and real estate. And I'm a regulated guy. I've got investments in a, a wide range of reporting issuers. And so for me, I was just trying to defend my turf. At the same time, as you know, I've disclosed, I had a weighting of 3% of Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Litecoin at the time in 2017. And I really couldn't talk about it. And, you know, I've, I've disclosed this now from over a year until things loosened up in Switzerland, in France, in Germany, in Italy, in Canada. Canada has an ETF in Ethereum and in Bitcoin. So now I can talk about it and I can disclose that I'm on my way by year end to 7% weighting in all types of crypto assets. I'm on board. I've changed my mind, and I think that takes a little flexibility, but I can never live down that piece of tape. It gets shoved up my orifice every single day. We, we've forgiven you, and I'll tell you why we've forgiven you, because you've gone from that to becoming an absolute degen. Let's well, I appreciate Let's get into some DeFi and take a portion of the assets and wrap it into the Ethereum chain, and let's start making some interest. Let's start looking at different ways that we can loan our, our assets out and start making four, five, six, seven, eight. You and I have talked about this. I have gotten way down that rabbit hole, and, and I'm way deep into that now. You're way deep into that. But you know what? If you've changed, it means that people can change. Um, so it gives me hope. <laughs> it even yeah, means perfect. that maybe Peter can change one day. Yeah. Well, first of all, you know, Kevin admitted before the program that he wasn't wearing any shorts. And I guess that's a good thing because he's going to lose them in crypto. You know, <laughs> Ke Ke Kevin, Kevin was right back then. Uh, you know, the only thing that's changed, Kevin, is the bubble's gotten bigger and the price has gone up. But all the fundamentals, the problem that you had with Bitcoin back in that clip, 
That hasn't changed. You were right then. You've just kind of given in uh, to the, the hype and the hysteria uh, of the moment. You know, you, the, the market's going up and you're now caught up in it. And, you know, once you get inside a bubble, you know, you can't really see reality. But I think if, you know, if, if somebody came to Shark Tank with a cockamamie idea uh, that was anything like crypto, I mean, you guys wouldn't put a nickel in it. You wouldn't even do one of your royalty deals on something like this. This is just pure Peter, it, mania. It's, it's fair to have the debate, but let me give you a real life reason and situation that I've made such a 180 degrees on this thing. Back at the end of 19 before, 2019, before the pandemic started, I started selling down our commercial real estate portfolio, which was 30, 31% of our operating company book. For a bunch of reasons, we started selling it down and it went into cash. Well, normally in an operating company, you have five or 6% cash. We ended up with 28% cash by March in 2020. As you know, I can't even make 20 basis points on cash while we're trying to redeploy it. That was when I hired a couple of guys to come into my shop, you know, really smart kids that were doing a lot of contracts on stable coins. And they said, hey, boss, let's put a few million bucks to work. Let us do it. We'll set up everything we're going to need. I can make a 5% interest right now on USDC. And I said, really? Do tell. What about DAI? What about some other stable coins? And we started to build this portfolio up of contracts on 30, 60, 90, 120 days, 360 days with USDC. And lo and behold, I'm getting three and a half to four percent cash. That's a practical reason that institutions are now following into crypto because you don't but, make but any money on cash. What's wrong? Well, with you're that talking about you're, first of all, you're talking about stable coins, and I don't know, you know, what type of loans they're involved with to pay you that three or four percent or five percent. Obviously, you're taking a greater degree of risk to get some of that return. But stable coins have got nothing to do with Bitcoin or any of these other cryptocurrencies because they're tied to something real, or in this case, you know, the U.S. dollar. I mean, a, a coin that was tied to gold or something would be a lot more stable long term than one that's tied to a fiat currency but at least it's tied to the dollar and it gives it some type of stability at least it's as stable as the dollar uh, but bitcoin is tied to nothing bitcoin is just you know a casino chip except it doesn't even have the plastic but, but you know, Peter, you, it, it's are, a, do i see a chink in your armor are you admitting now that it's okay <laughs> for an institution to actually deploy some usdc because there's 29 billion dollars of it in circulation when i yeah, got i don't know two billion. You, you have the counterparty risk uh, I don't know what, you know, what they're doing with the money that you use to buy them. And is it really worth it? I personally don't think that that's even that exciting a return. You know, I, you know, there are a lot of good stocks around the world that pay higher dividends than that. And so I, I'd rather be in something real in an inflationary time period. Uh, inflation is going to erode away the value of all those stable coins that are tied to U.S. dollars. So even though you're getting some interest, I don't think it will be enough in the long run to overcome the loss of purchasing power. But that does not mean that you should go to the crypto casino and just gamble on these tokens because these can implode at any minute. OK, so I think we're going to disagree on a whole lot of things today. But I think the one thing that we're all going to agree on today is that the worst place to be right now is the U.S. dollar. Am I right about that, Mooch? The worst place? No. And listen, I don't think it's the worst place because it's the uh, the tallest of the relative fiat currencies. But it is a bad place because of what they're doing in the dollar. Ultimately, they're they're corrupting the dollar. You know, Peter wrote best selling books about this. The uh, the way we're monetizing our debt and the way we're printing money, 469 billion U.S. dollars printed this year in the first five months. It erodes the ability for the middle and lower middle income people to catch up with the wealthy. And it's creating all of this political angst, but uh, not the worst place. I, there, there are a few worse places. Yeah, like Bitcoin. You know, like as an example, well, you see, here's the thing. I am convinced after now studying Peter and uh, Peter, uh, you know, he, he was very forceful and very persuasive yesterday on his gold pitch on the Intelligence Squared debate. But I'm convinced that Peter owns Bitcoin. I'm absolutely convinced of it because I wish he, I, I look. I wish I owned he, it. I don't. The way I he just... talks about it, I think he's accumulating it and he's <laughs> trying to push the price down because I think Peter sees what uh, Kevin sees, and and I admire Kevin's flexibility because he was a Bitcoin skeptic and now he he got invested. And and ultimately, it's what Andreessen said. This is a software that has transformed the world. 
and is gonna allow us to do things with each other that we could never do before without an intermediary. And when you stop and you think about that shorter distance, there's no longer a triangle, Rob. There's a distance just between me and the person that I wanna transact with as a direct result of the blockchain, Bitcoin, and some of these other ecosystems that are developing. It's gonna manu massively change the world. Yeah, but, but that's all a bunch of hype so far. Nothing has been transformed. All you have is people collecting uh, you know, digital tokens and, and gambling with them. That's it. I mean, it hasn't changed anybody's life other than you're some people are richer because of people and bought the it. Of these wallets, you're leaving out uh, all of the infrastructure and architecture that's being put in place to create this massive super highway. I'm going to yeah. let Raul talk. All that is malinvestment, though. That's he all going to be early. He, Raul knows how early it is, but I'm, I'm also <laughs> looking for an invite to his. Uh, is Cayman Islands mansion, so that's why I'm puffing him up a little bit. Go ahead, Rob. <laughs> we banned you. I've told you this. You're never coming here. It's truly unbelievable. I'm, I'm stuck in New York, Rob. Kevin's trying to get in as well. It's just yeah, sorry, no, not listen, in, I, I, I've, I've, I've talked, I've the talked to them place. there. I, I want in. I want to come down there. I want to set up myself. I'm going to build my condo on top of Mark Cuban's. That's my plan. <laughs> yeah, but you still got to pay taxes in the Caymans if you're an American. See, Rob, mm -hmm. you know, you, what, are, what are you? You're British? I'm British. Yeah, so you're you're free. You know, you can go wherever you want in the world, and uh, the UK is not taxing you. But but we're stuck, and so you got to come to Puerto same Rico. Same to Canadians as well. Yeah. Well, well you can just yep. give back your passport. I mean, you could just Peter, if you really want to get out, you could just hand back your passport. Yeah, I'm not ready to do that just yet. So Puerto Rico. Okay. So far, Puerto Rico is great. I love living there. Beautiful but the place difference is, so, Peter, is let, let me pose a question. question. Let me, let's go back to this issue on gold versus Bitcoin, okay? What's wrong with owning both? I've got a 5% weighting in gold I have for 20 years. I've I'm, got bullion I pay storage for. I use the GLD to balance on a quarterly basis. I buy into the gold story. I always have. But what's wrong with adding a little dabble do ya of Bitcoin? What's wrong with putting well, in a portfolio? What's wrong to with To me, it? it's not about a question of Bitcoin versus gold, right? To me, it's like, Bitcoin versus GameStop or, you know, AMC or, you know, any other meme stop or, you know, to me, that's a speculative asset. Gold is where I put my safe money, money that I want liquid that I don't want to lose. I just and, want to store but value. Peter, that's, but that's fine. For, that's fine. Right. Nobody, right. nobody has an argument with that. But Bitcoin and the crypto world is the fastest adoption of any technology in all recorded human history. It's growing at 113 oh. percent a year. It's 140 million people. There'll be a billion users by 2024. You can't say, well, this is all irrelevant. Everybody's being deluded. This is a madness. Only gold is the truth. No, no, no. First of all, it's got nothing to do with gold. It's a speculative asset. So if you're saying, where do I want to put my chips? What speculative assets do I want to gamble on? Personally, I think there's a lot more upside potential relative to the downside risk in other speculative opportunities that I am taking advantage of. I, I, I just, I don't believe in Bitcoin. You know, I never have. I don't think it's going to work. And so I, I can't buy it and put it away because I don't have any faith in it. Uh, but there are other speculative assets that I would rather uh, own. But as far as uh, something so what, that's what, conservative, what a store of value, what, Bitcoin what, doesn't even qualify as that. So it, it, it's all hype. Having, what would you see having a similar risk reward to Bitcoin? So Bitcoin on average, you know, you're going to see a 60% downside and a 213% upside a year, right? That's the well, risk you don't, you don't know that. Bitcoin has been around for about a dozen years, right? That is not a long enough time horizon to say that you know anything concrete. And the entire time Bitcoin's been around, but we've been Facebook's in a gigantic been bubble. The same, right? Huh? Facebook's been around the same. So is Google. No, no, but yeah, but we've Facebook is a company that has revenues and customers. It's got nothing to do with Bitcoin. Bitcoin's just a token. But my point is, Bitcoin's entire life history has been during this gigantic bubble. Zero percent interest rates, quantitative easing. It hasn't been in a cycle. You know, all kinds of crazy stuff are going up. People are just buying all kinds of nonsense. It's all momentum. It's all hype. You can't draw any conclusions about what Bitcoin is going to do in the future by looking in the rearview mirror for the last dozen years. It's going to have to be around a lot longer than that. And in my opinion, it won't be around a lot longer. Worthless. Is the network of Bitcoin itself worthless? I don't know what the network is worth, right? Uh, I don't think the coins it, have any worthless? value or the Bitcoin. I, look, I don't know. 
I, I don't think the, I don't think Bitcoin itself is worth anywhere near what people are willing to pay for it. And I think history is going to bear me out. I don't know what that network is worth and what else it might be able to be but, used but for Peter, other than gambling with Bitcoin. You, in a company, you just made a point of a company with revenue and customers. All right. When you invest in any company, you are speculating as well that the management of that company can deliver on the perpetual earnings that you think they can do and, in fact, grow the business. There's many times. Let's take Kmart, for example, where executional risk in the end made it worthless. They weren't any good at doing it. When you make a speculative investment, when you buy a Picasso or a Warhol or whatever it is, you're speculating that others will will look at that. I have, to, for example, I bought a Warhol. I've got the eleventh Mick Jagger. I'm speculating that that will be worth more ten years from now. You know, because people will think that that's rare. What's the right, difference but, between my Warhol and my Bitcoin? What's the well? Difference? Because there is a long history, you know, going back a long time of wealthy people appreciating owning art and collecting art and displaying art on a wall, it gives you a lot of satisfaction to have rare pieces of art, you know, hanging in your house that, you know, you can admire, you can enjoy, you can impress your friends. There's a lot of value. And yes, it's not even so much that when you're buying a piece of art, it's that I think it's going to go way up. It's like, I want to preserve my wealth. I got a bunch of paper. I've already got real estate. I've got stocks. What else can I do with my money? Let me put it in some art. You know, it's because paper can always become worthless. So you have to have real things. And a rare piece of art uh, is rare, is actually truly scarce. I don't think there's anything really rare or scarce about any of these cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin. Nobody's going to impress their okay. friends with a picture okay. of their Bitcoin wallet hanging on their wall. I mean, it's okay. not. And when you're talking about a company, right, right. When you buy a business, I, certain I, I, companies. And Raul, okay. is gonna, Raul is totally going to impress people with his Bitcoin wallet. Okay, Raul, put <laughs> well, that Bitcoin wallet on your wall. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> I'm impressed Let's, already. Let's not make this all about gold versus Bitcoin. Let's zoom out and say the following. Under the assumption that Kevin, Raul, and uh, Mooch are irresponsibly long Bitcoin and crypto, and I can see it through his shirt. Right now, if you were sitting on US dollars, where would you put the US dollars? If you couldn't put any more into crypto... I want to disagree. There's no way Kevin is as long as me and Raul, because look at the way he's dressed, okay? Uh -huh. Couple of more digits, and Kevin will be in a black t shirt like the two of us. I must admit, he was so on the pump. Wait, what is that the same t shirt? Long enough because he doesn't, he's not wearing the right fashion. Is that the same t shirt? On the pump podcast, so is that the same t shirt? Let Moose Wait, just pump. I can't let that go. You know, I'm a fashionista, and I'm yeah. trying to raise But is that the, the same t shirt you wore yesterday, or oh, you have no, like I a, have 25 no, of this these? This is a this is a little bit tighter okay no, this, no, no, no. My man boobs. As, this t -shirt's coming my man i'm boobs. raising the bar on you guys okay you've got to catch up with me i'm setting the standard for crypto fashion i am the crypto fashionista self-declared right now i look just spectacular not, but most of the people in crypto don't even own a necktie exactly yeah. just like now, you this, this is view. a magical tie this is a digital tie right here it's a beautiful thing <laughs> Just like he changed his views on Bitcoin and crypto, he'll change his views on wearing a suit. I guarantee you, we all did. We all did. We're all in. Yeah. Well, he'll lose that too. Yeah. So you got US dollars. You, you, you can't put any more money into crypto. Peter, you also can't put any more money into crypto. Well, what I don't do have any with... money in crypto. So I, I mean, it's like... what, do you do with, what, what do you do with US dollars today, Raul? No so more crypto. I'm actually long US dollars because I think the dollar's going up because I think the world is actually slowing down again. So I'm long US dollars and long some bonds. And those are the only two other trades I've got in the world. And I've also got some carbon futures uh, in, in Europe. So those are the only three trades I've got. The carbon futures is a fantastic long-term story that just it's driven by the incentive system within the EU to, to, um, to raise the price of carbon. And these futures are directly linked to that. And then I'm long dollars and, and long some bonds because I think the world slows down a bit and the rest is pretty much 100% crypto. Yeah. Mitch? Well, we're basically more or less out of the bond market. We've got, uh, we're reducing our structured credit exposure uh, because of the lack of interest rates in that area. And we're, 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 we're in growth stocks actually. So uh, I don't, you know, I don't own dollars the way Raul owns them, but I own a lot of U.S. dollar denominated uh, growth companies. And are you not concerned that the market has repriced itself and we're seeing the markets at all time highs? 
uh, today? Are you not concerned? Rand, that you Rand, this is a really interesting point, right? Because everybody goes to this and says the markets are expensive and therefore there's risk. Play that through right now. If the markets fall 15%, what is the reaction function of central banks? It's currently to print more money. So in which case stocks go back up. We had the largest recession in all recorded history. It lasted two months because of the ridiculous amount of monetary printing. So now that both the governments and the central banks know that they have one trick that can basically, in their mind, stop a recession, they will use it all the time. So it's a weird world where buying puts used to be a profitable strategy when you got the timing right, but actually it's buying calls into that that actually makes more money. You want to be on the long side and assume that the central bank owns the down 15% and lower put, um, and it's free for you. So it's kind of skewed how the world works. And I kind of agree with Mooch is that in the end, growth stocks have proven over time that in lower interest rates and a kind of weird growth environment, they will outperform massively because they're also seeing network effects and the massive rise of technology. And some of them, they, have, they, some of them have tiny amounts of yield, believe it or not. Yeah, yeah, that underperformance, though, is going to end when the money printing that you're referring to unleashes much greater increases in, in prices for raw materials, consumer producer prices. So when we get into a very high inflationary environment, at least the way it's measured uh, by you know, the government indexes, then a lot of money is going to move out of those growth stocks into companies that actually earn money and pay dividends that can raise and, and, and somehow keep people above inflation. But what you're talking about when you own a lot of dollars because you think there's gonna be problems. I mean, the reason people are buying dollars now is because they're anticipating this tightening cycle, but there isn't actually any tightening going on. All that's happening is the Fed talks about tapering. Maybe they'll taper a little bit, maybe they won't. What we know for sure is they're never gonna get around to raising interest rates because long before they finish the taper, the market will tank, will be in recession, and the next round of stimulus is going to be bigger than what we had after COVID. I mean, the, 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 the QE keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger because the bubble is bigger, the addiction is bigger. And so eventually these dollar rallies are going to get smaller and smaller because the tightening cycles are smaller and smaller. And then the even, easing even cycles even are bigger. Even if you're right, let's say you're right. And let's give you that scenario out for the next six months. You still have to be long equities in that scenario because if you go back in time, and look at inflation creeping into the market, not hyperinflation, but what you're talking about is maybe the Fed even suggesting they start to tighten. You're not going to get competition from fixed income or the dollar in its liquid currency until the 10 year has a three handle in front of yeah, it. Yeah, I, I do. I mean, I that's do a own a very long time from now. And so in the meantime, you want to own stocks, even the index itself, because it tends to outperform even as you start to tighten. People well, think, well, I want to correct. Like, I'm, I'm, I have a lot of equities. I want to just be selective. I want to buy stocks that I think have real value. Almost everything I'm buying is outside the United States because I, I perceive much greater risks and problems here in the United States. So um, I'm abroad. But yeah, I keep some cash and I keep some dollars because I do think that you could continue to see lower prices and I'll buy more equities in Pete, any kind of decline. For you. Do you ever own technology companies with network effects or have that, have those valuations, those growth valuations of kind of been out of your matrix of how you invest. So you, no. you stick to value investing. No, I've owned uh, tech stocks in the past. I mean, not in the recent past. I haven't been there. And I, I may look at them again one day if, if they really get cheap, if everybody starts, you know, getting rid of them. But right now, the stocks that nobody is buying are the ones that I want. I mean, they're, they're where you get the good value and the good dividends. And, uh, they, you know, they kind of came into, into favor recently. But now, you know, a lot of the stocks that I own, they're the ones that are correcting because people are kind of reversing their bets on the inflation trade. People are now think, oh, there is no inflation because the Fed is going to stamp it out. The Fed is going to tighten and inflation is transitory. It's not transitory. It's just getting started. And the Fed's not going to do anything but throw gasoline on the fire. I just want to say one thing to my fellow guests, and, and something I learned actually from Mr. Wonderful is about the adaptability and about understanding that the world is moving at an exponential pace. And so what I love about Kevin is he had a point of view, and then he stepped back and he said, okay, wait a minute, let me challenge my hypothesis and let me look at the world. And so it's reminiscent of Thomas Malthus. He said that we were all gonna starve. The food was not going to pace the population growth. 
but he missed irrigation and all those technological developments. And I just think that Peter's line of thinking, which I respect and is something I was trained to study in the 80s and 90s, I think we've had a seismic change in the world and we're about to have an introduction of newer and newer technologies, AI, robotic technology, biotechnology, software programmable biotechnology, all of these things are going to lead to an unleashing of exponential growth that we can't yeah. understand in our primordial system. Yeah. We're sitting here in a 100,000 year old piece of machinery that hasn't evolved. And yet our iPhone went from iPhone one to 13 in 10 years. Yeah. And otherwise, in other words, it's different this time. Yeah, I know that's no, what I they always say. I think <laughs> they, it's they, the same they, this time. I think it's, it goes to the tweet that I think Raul, you made this tweet earlier saying, I still see people calling crypto a bubble uh, and thus it's unsustainable. I mean, you looked at the, at the, at the charts, but then you compared it with the tech stock overvaluation, and I guess it it, it speaks the same. It speaks volumes. Well, I, yeah, I agree. Many, I think everything forward, that's right? speculative is overvalued. All those tech stocks are overvalued too. I just think that Bitcoin is even more overvalued because those tech stocks have some value. I just think the prices are too high. I don't think Bitcoin has any okay, value. Let, so any price that. is too high. For, let's stay with that thought for a second. And let me propose something to you, Peter, and the rest of the group to debate because I live this every day. I service institutions and sovereign funds, pension plans in the indexing business that I'm a partner in. And well, here's what they tell me. And you can debate this till the cows come home, but I've come to believe it, which is really what's turned me around on my crypto portfolio. I own a lot more than Bitcoin today. They want to play in crypto. And the only thing that's keeping them out, whether it be Bitcoin or stable coins or tokens or whatever it is, is they have no compliance infrastructure. So here's how it goes. They go to their committees and say, look, I want to put on a three to 5% weighting and a, a set of different crypto assets. Are you guys okay? Now, most of us that deal in stocks and bonds, and I certainly do, I have an infrastructure that marks to market my holdings by the second. My internal compliance sees it. They give it to the independent auditors every week. They audit every month and we issue our compliance to the regulator as we have to in our different mandates. There is no infrastructure yet today to do that institutionally in crypto. And that's why in just let's talk Bitcoin. I believe I really believe this, that there's a trillion dollars worth of buying if we could provide two things to the institutional buyer solve the ESG problem on the mining and award of coins. For example, that's become a big issue. Everybody knows about it. It was a two, Bitcoin 2021. It was a huge deal. And I'll tell you something really funny about that conference that I haven't disclosed to a lot of people in that audience. Cause I was, you know, pat that panel. I was the chair of that panel. And we were talking about how these giant miners were going to solve the problem. I look into the audience with sunglasses on and baseball caps pulled over their faces are all the institutional clients that I service. The big guys, they were there, but they didn't want to be seen there. They didn't want to be known to be there. They're walking around with plastic bags, listening to this stuff because they want to come into that market and they can't do it yet. So we got to solve ESG and we got to solve the compliance platform. Now, there are companies like Circle and like FTX that are starting to build that infrastructure. And when they figure it out, Katie, bar the doors, Peter, you're going to be left looking pretty dumb because that asset class will become an institutional <laughs> asset is, all around the world. Like, like, so Kevin, if, there's if, another if, group called yeah. LUKKA. They do, one of the issues is there's no open close. There's no official pricing. All the exchanges have different prices. There's a group called Luca that's putting that all together to make like the ISM market or S&P global for the authentic prices for all the accounting firms for audits. So they're scaling super fast right now. So it's all coming. And like you and, and like Mooch, I spend probably a third of my week or a quarter of my week speaking to sovereign wealth funds, family offices, and global institutions who are all trying to get up the, the, the curve on this. I mean, everybody's yeah, look, making the move. It's not, look, it's not, not going to happen. I mean, literally well, the whole lot of them are. Well, look, everybody is not going to do it. Look, throughout my career, I've overestimated the intelligence of institutional investors. So I'm sure that there are some of them dumb enough to bite on this. You know, there's a lot of greed. You know, the market's gone up, especially if they can gamble with other people's money. They might take a shot, you know, and then they can take a percentage of the ups. Um, but, you know, I, I think 
buying into this because I think there's some greater institutional fool that's going to throw even more money at this if we could just make it easier for them to do it. Uh, that's not something that I want to do. I mean, maybe it'll work. Maybe it won't. You know, there are other things that I think are going to make a lot of money in this environment that I want to own. This is a historic we'll financial we'll bubble. Uh, Can we'll I ask about you a question? Rob, would it be okay for me to ask Peter a question? Because I'm fascinated by Peter. <laughs> You know, yeah, go for it, please. I mean, in, in, in Italian, he's gabados, Raul. You know what gabados means? He's got cement in his head. I, say, I got <laughs> brains in my head. You, know, you guys have bubbles in your head. That's the problem. I want to just understand if, if guys like Ray Dalio say they don't like Bitcoin, they do the research, they buy Bitcoin. Guys like Mr. Wonderful say, hey, I don't like Bitcoin. They do the research, they buy Bitcoin. And I can give you a litany of other people. My, you know, you probably don't think I'm intelligent, which is fine, but. <laughs> I did the research and I got myself long Bitcoin. What is it that all of these people are missing, Peter? What, what is it that all Again, are missing? I mean, there are other people, right? You know, Warren Buffett, Nassim Tlaib. Hasn't uh, done the work. No, no, no. You, you just work. Warren won't not do the work. No, no, no. You All just assume Munger will not no, do the work. You just assume that somebody who's an intelligent, successful investor if they're not investing in Bitcoin, it's because they didn't do the work. Maybe well, they make, did the work. The maybe Bitcoin they maybe they came there, to a different conclusion. The they're, work, they're, make the Bitcoin case, because what Munger says is you got to be able to make the other side's case better than your own case. So make the Bitcoin case. You, if you've done the work, make the Bitcoin case. No, I know what people say to buy Bitcoin. They 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 make they say the same thing that's that I say that's about thing. fiat money and inflation and central banks. And then they say, buy Bitcoin because it's better than gold because there's only 21 million of them and, and it, it's more divisible and it's, it's more scarce because there may be some gold on some asteroid that we can mine one day. And, you know, it, and there's no counterparty we can transact. You know, and okay. it's, you know okay. and I, okay. I mean, I know yeah. all the yeah. stuff about Bitcoin, why you it's supposedly it. so great, because I've been hearing it for a decade now. Okay, we got it. Uh, Kev, you mentioned legislation and you mentioned that the institutions need two things, that they need legislation and they need this ESG FUD sorted. Let's look at the two, the two matters one at a time. ESG FUD primarily was a function of non-green mining, which was primarily in China. Uh, China did us the biggest favor of our lives and shut down Bitcoin in China. And it seems like the migration of the mining assets is to the U.S., and to more greener mining. Uh, even Elon Musk seems to be a little bit more convinced that it's moving in the right direction, and he was the one who started all this fight. Um, how do you feel now after the migration of miners from China? Here's the game plan. Here's what's going to happen. This is my speculation, but I'm actually acting on it with capital. So this debate around uh, trying to segregate coins, uh, one a dirty coin mined in China versus a clean coin mined in Texas or whatever, that's not going to happen. Bitcoin has to be fungible. It doesn't matter. But there's still 30 years of mining, 40 years of mining left to do. Here's what I think is going to happen. Here's how I'm betting my capital on it. If I can invest, let's say, in West Texas, okay, and I can keep every coin I'm awarded having been mined there with certainty, with solar and with wind, all right, and every one of those coins has provenance from that one facility, that node that was built there, why isn't that a solution for me as an institution, okay? Because the minute I disclose I had 3%, all my institutional clients called me saying, where'd the coin come from? How do you know with certainty that would, that, that would pass our ESG committees? And by the way, is any of that, you know, the indexes we license from you? And I said, no, 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 no. This is my operating company. These are not in your indices. And so that was, you know, I was scared. I was pretty scared shitless when that was happening because I can't get these guys non-compliant. Then I started talking to them saying, what if you came in with me? We set up our own stacks. We hire management to do it and we mine our own coin. And based on how much you put up towards the CapEx, let's say it's going to cost $500 million, which it is. You'll own those coins on a prorated basis. That's what I'm going to do. That's coming to a theater near you. That's exactly what I'm working on now. And I'm getting lots of institutional interest in it 
for those that want to take on the allocation because they can check the box with their ESG committees. Yeah. Look, and Kevin, it works. I mean, well, Kevin, works. this is the kind this is the kind of yeah, malinvestment and crazy speculation that you get when you have zero percent interest rates and quantitative easing and all this nonsense. Meanwhile, the real economy is deteriorating. That money should be invested productively, not squandered on producing nothing. But also, Kevin, when you talk about how we're going to get all this new regulation uh, and Bitcoin, which is going to make it more appealing to the institutions, all that additional regulation just makes it less appealing as an alternative uh, you know, to a fiat currency or gold or whatever they're trying to claim, because that regulation simply runs up the transaction costs of actually using Bitcoin to do anything. You know, it, Peter, in the, Peter, does that yeah, mean yeah. I should put you down for twenty-five million on the index? You're in. Uh, <laughs> sure. Yeah, pencil me in. Oh, I, I think he's long it. By the way, I you know I can't wait till he announces himself as a Bitcoin billionaire. Because I've always Peter, thought about set. You set up a newsletter. One is really negative. One is really positive, and sell both sides of it. So he's got his son set up as the. As yeah. the positive Bitcoin, him sets up yeah. as the negative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, 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 my college sophomore son, I mean, he does have, he's, he's, he's got a tidy amount of Bitcoin. He's a little kid. Guys, guys, <laughs> I, I, I want to do a, a quick commercial break for a politician that Mooch is very familiar and likes a lot. I look at social media all the time. The master, the best politician I see out there in terms of using social on all of these issues is AOC. And I want to show you the t shirt that I'm getting for all of you guys. I just bought this from her shop. She's making 82% gross margin on this. Inside of every single socialist, there's a capitalist screaming to get out. I'm a big supporter. Get me your addresses. I'm going to send you one of these, and we'll all wear it together next time we have this debate. Where's, I where, love where, this. Where, 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 where is she the making them? The radio rock. I'm not <laughs> going to be wearing that shirt. I mean, I know I may have a face for radio or Morse code, but I'm only going to be wearing that shirt on the radio. But AOC is a capitalist. She's an innovator, and she's incredibly hardworking. Uh -huh. In, in in socialist clothing, which I think is another amazing part of the irony and the hypocrisy of our society. Also, the other irony here is the only ones who are playing capital gains tax are not the ones holding, holding gold, because I think it's been going down now for the last year. So <laughs> well, that's assuming you're trading it. I mean, I don't, you know, I, you you don't know, really I'm not selling. You don't really need to live in Puerto Rico. You could live huh? anywhere. You could live in California. Uh, because I don't have any capital gains, <laughs> I'm gonna, right. I'm, gonna I, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna have a lot of capital gains. But also, you know, I pay four percent income tax on what I earn. See, so that's a big number too, and I earn that every year. So uh, I, I save that. But yeah, I mean, um, I think my capital gains savings are going to be in the future when I actually start realizing my capital gains. And by the way, I expect capital gains to be much higher in the future than they are right now. The rate could be 50, 60, 70 percent. Who knows? Uh, which is one of the reasons I wanted to get to Puerto Rico to kind of hedge that exposure because I don't want to see the government confiscate all my capital gains uh, through taxation. And a lot of those capital gains won't even be real. It's going to be an illusion because it's not going to be my assets gaining value. It's going to be dollars losing value. And so when the dollar crashes, everybody has capital gains, even if they're not richer. Uh, so that's another way the government really profits except from inflation. If you buy, except if you buy gold with U.S. dollars, because then there's no capital gains. Well, gold, you know, so 20 years ago, gold was under $300 an ounce. So now it's around 1700 Seems to me it's in a nice, stable, long-term uptrend. So I don't think anything's happened to, this, you know, to upset that. Here's a question I want to ask. Is, we talked about art. Kevin talked about Warhol. Peter, you nodded your head and said art has value because rich people decided it does. What do you think about NFTs? Well, I don't think NFTs are ultimately going to have any value. I don't think it just having an NFT okay, of let, a let me painting let me challenge is, that is, thought is, because I'm going down the NFT rabbit hole in a big Yeah, way. sure, because you can make some asset. money in it. I know. No, no, no. Let me pick one asset class, okay? Let's talk about NFTs for a second in a way that maybe others haven't yet. Let's just take an industry that Peter will agree appreciates in value. I'm a huge watch collector. I have a very, very, very large collection of watches, including some one of a kind that were made for me by artists like Roger Smith or F.P. Jorn. Now, if I have a one of a kind Jorn, all right, and let's say I paid a quarter of a million dollars for it and it's only one of it, and I walk out of the store today, which is actually happening, it goes up 114% into the auction market. The problem is I can't auction the piece because FP himself knows that I own it. He's still alive. He's the Picasso watchmaking. And I will be banned in perpetuity 
from ever buying another FP Zorn. However, let's just follow my thought on this. I said to FP, there are at least five collectors, some of them in the royal family in the Middle East, that would buy from me and want from me the serialized NFT of that one-of-a-kind Zorn. And I can put it up to auction. And you designed the face, FP. You designed the face that they want. It's your design. That's what made FP so valuable. Will you let me make three NFTs? One, the serial number will be 000, the second 001, and the third 002. 001 stays with the watch in perpetuity to authenticate it, and Lloyds of London will insure it because it's got that authenticated FP Jordan serial number in the NFT. The other two go to auction. And you, if you wish and give me the permission, will participate in perpetuity of as yes. that NFT trades. Yeah. Why isn't me... that going to work? Why is well, that because gonna work? when you actually owned the original watch, you have the watch. I mean, you can hold it. You can put it on your wrist. You have an actual thing. A picture of a watch is not the same as the watch. And I would be happy. I could, you know, make a copy of your original. And yeah, it won't be the original, but I could have a copy of it on my computer screen and I could look at a picture of that watch. There's a difference between an image of the watch that can be replicated, uh, uh, you know, in an infinite number of times and the actual watch itself. I mean, even if I try to replicate the watch by creating you know a knockoff of the watch it's not the same watch it, it's and so that's not the case with these pictures i mean even a so baseball Peter, card an admit. actual baseball card is not the same as a photograph of that baseball card yeah. on your computer pt you've got to admit there's something called photographic art and if but it's not going to yes but it's not going to have a collector value i i i, I, I you can look so you can you have posters buy, if you want to buy a mick rock photograph of David Bowie from 1972, and you want to have that signed by Mick Rock and with the negative, that is worth a lot of money. But it's the actual photograph as opposed to a digital image of that photograph, which just everybody a, can have. Just a photograph. You can replicate it all day. No, but it's we not can... that. Right, but it's not the original one. So exactly. So what? Right, but it, but it's an else? actual thing I, I in reality. He does because when a photographer the makes a series of ten images and signs them, you do not own the only one, but they trade at huge values. There, I collect what? black and white photography. When I know it's one of ten or one of sixteen or one of two hundred and fifty, whatever the series is, and the negative is held by the estate and will never print another one. The value of those prints, and remember, there's multiple yes, prints, not but, just one, goes up. Right, I know that. And the value is diminished because there's more than one. And if there was only one, it would be worth more than if there's 200 no, of them, maybe. It but it goes up if there's more prints. Same with more, the watch well, NFT. Well, at some point, the curve has to bend. I mean, if I are make a million saying, of them. Are but, you saying that you see no value in this? You're ignoring human nature, NFT. though. No, I, I look, there could be some small value and in, in maybe the image quality of that one is is a little bit greater than what I could just copy, you know. On but it's these are not things that are going to go up in value. What what the reason that collector items go up in value is because they're originally created not to be collected, to be used. And what happens is most of them end up being destroyed. They're not well kept. And the ones that survive, you know, years and years later, oh, all of a sudden somebody wants them and they have value. If you produce something specifically to be collected, hey, we're making these things. And then everybody buys, spends all this money based on the fact that they're, oh, it's going to go up in okay. value. It's not going to okay. work. This thing is going to okay. collapse. This, again, gotcha. this is all bubble and malinvestment. Okay, you gotcha, know, gotcha. We wouldn't be talking about any of this if we had sound monetary policy. Okay, let's put that aside. Guys, the other three guys, um, NFT mania, is this the most exciting thing that you guys have seen in a long time? Because I'm looking at the NFT industry. I've never seen an industry explode like this. I've never seen network effects being built like this. Are you guys as excited about NFTs as I am? Uh, yes, I am. And Peter, it's well, got to be frustrating to you. I think, I think you're going to find that value will be perceived in a generation that's growing up with NFTs in a way that you couldn't even forecast. Well, we'll see. I, One of my neighbors here in Puerto Rico lives here as an artist. Uh, Alec Monopoly did a bunch of NFTs and Sold them out. I mean, I actually, I mean, look, people you know, are making money. Doing one it. of your neighbors, and Jordan Freed, is there. He owns the domain nft.com and he's issuing profiles now. I invested in his company. I heard his pitch and I thought, this is the craziest idea I've ever, I've ever heard. I want to buy a third of it. I thought it was fantastic. <laughs> and I'm, I'm supporting him now. And we're, he's going to be part of that whole watch initiative. 
I'm flying over to Dubai. Many of the collectors in the world, Peter, many of the largest collectors, individuals, want their watches cataloged through the NFT. Well, that process. well, that's fine. I mean, if you want to have an NFT of your watch and the NFT goes with the actual watch, and and that's different than saying you get the NFT and that's it. You don't actually have a real watch attached to it. You just get a picture of a watch. You know, that's totally different than saying, hey, this NFT authenticates this watch. And when I sell you the watch, you get the NFT to prove that you own it. But then, you know, how much extra value does that really have? But, but to say I, that- Just interrupt for one second, Peter. I obviously think you're very smart, so I'm listening very intently, but you're, there's a gap in your logical thinking process and that is the irrationality and illogical thinking of human beings. And if you oh, go through, I, I, if you go through well, 5, I agree. 500 years of human beings, what Kevin is saying is absolutely true. We collect things, we collect baubles, we associate with things. And if you're going to fractionalize artistic creation and give the opportunity to somebody to own a small piece of a Warhol, a small piece of an FP Jorn. But they own nothing. They don't own the Warhol. But they don't they own a small piece of it. But I agree, Anthony. And now trade uh, Anthony, else. I agree with you that are there going to be people dumb enough to buy this nonsense? Of course. Of course there is. The question is, will these idiots in the long run end up making money? Because remember, somebody's going to be left holding the bag. How old do you if remember they, the two thousand year old man with Mel Brooks and Carl Reiner? I got to get Peter to redo that show. I mean, you're like the two thousand year old man. Why? Because <laughs> I have wisdom. I mean, Peter, I have. I, 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 I understand it's, it's, history. I feel like and I'm NFTs, back in the cave. We should start painting the cave together. You and, and uh, uh, NFTs that we see now are the first iteration, right? Art happened to be the first thing that exploded out. <laughs> of this is going to be the. Um, tokenization of real estate, the tokenization of communities, yeah, the tokenization yep, yep. You of can, IP rights. And that's yep, you all can, yep, you get some idiot to buy a digital house and a digital car. I mean, all kinds of... What about, what, about <laughs> NFTs, what about NFTs like video game NFTs where right now you have video games where, that have over, over a million players and through NFT gaming, people are making... People in Philippines are making three or four times more than the minimum wage just playing yeah. video games and look, that's the, and this look, is the I, look when i when i look I, I used a kid i used to play monopoly and we had monopoly money just because i we had monopoly money doesn't mean it has value in the real world because it has value in, in monopoly yeah you can have games and nfts that have value in those games but just to play the games you're not going to get rich on these things this is all a bunch of nonsense you guys just can't see this okay Mr. Wonderful, Bitcoin or Ethereum, if I were to put a gun to your head and say, you got $100,000, dollars you got to put it on one, you can't put it on, on both, you got a three-year holding period, where do you put your money? Bitcoin. It's the granddaddy, it's the institutional desire that most of the people I talk to, that whether they you know, are speculating or not, uh, want to establish compliance with their own groups at the institutional sovereign level with Bitcoin first. They're, they're, they're wrangling for 1% to 3%. I have this dialogue every day. They want to get through this whole ESG thing. We talked about that already. They want the compliance platform to mark to market for their internal accounting and internal compliance and external mark to market when there's capital gains involved or not. Most of these guys, which I got to tell you is interesting, they're not considering it a currency. They're considering it a property. They're going to buy it, check the box on the ESG thing when they get a way to do it, which means they may have to mine their own, and then hold it in perpetuity just like they do, as Peter suggested, with gold. They have made that allocation. If they were 5% weighted in bullion, maybe they're paying storage, maybe they're using an EFT like uh, GLD, whatever, but they want to own Bitcoin. So if you're putting my gun to my head, I would go long Bitcoin for the next 36 months. I think it'll beat the indices. I think you'll do better than 7 or 8% on it. Yes, it's going to be volatile, but I keep telling everybody, and I said it at Bitcoin 2021, when we solve it for them on compliance and ESG, Katie, bar the doors. We're talking about a trillion dollars worth of buying power. You want to see Bitcoin at 100,000? That's how it's going to happen. <laughs> Mitch, Bitcoin or Ethereum, gun on your head. I'll keep it brief, Bitcoin. Tell us why. Well, a lot of what Kevin just said, but more for me about the exponential growth of what Raul's thinking. 140 million wallets right now. Uh, accelerating to a billion wallets. Uh, you know, this is going to be Facebook. There'll, there'll be 2.8 billion users of Bitcoin on that network, and a result of which there'll be an explosive opportunity for returns. 
Raul, Bitcoin, Ethereum or Cardano? <laughs> Without question, Ethereum. It's <laughs> uh, by far and away the um, network effects are growing faster and deeper than Bitcoin, in fact, twice the speed. So it's, it's, it's growing at a dramatic pace. There are more applications. We've talked about NFTs. We've talked about DeFi. It's all on top of Ethereum. Will that change over three, after three years? Possibly. But the network effects, and that's how you value these things, is the number of nodes on the network, the growth of those nodes, and the interconnection of those nodes is growing so much faster than anything else. It's just going to outperform. That doesn't mean I don't like Bitcoin. I don't agree. You know, I agree with the, the store of value, the pristine collateral. I've made all these arguments. It's nothing to do with that. I just think yeah. Ethereum outperforms and my money's actually mainly in Ethereum these days. Uh, I must say I agree with you because I think that Bitcoin is a store of value and, it's, and there's a big space for a store of value. Ethereum is a call option on multiple new industries that haven't yet started. So the first option that was triggered was one on NFTs. Yeah. The second option was one of what they call decentralized finance. Don't you want my don't you want my answer? I'm, I'm coming to you. Peter. I think we both own Ethereum in addition to Bitcoin. <laughs> okay, Peter. So there's a gun to your head. You're not allowed to buy gold. The the answer is you got to buy Bitcoin or Ethereum. You you have to pick one, yeah. and you have to tell us why you pick the one you pick. You have to buy one. Which yeah. one do you buy? Peter's going to well, buy the first, gun. First of all, I might just take my <laughs> chances on. I I might just take my chances with the bullet. You know, I mean, you know, but but look, you know, I was going to say I was hoping all you guys were going to go Bitcoin so I could be the contrarian and go Ethereum. Uh, but, uh, you know, it seems like it's split 50 50. Um, so, you know, I, I I mean, I guess if I was going to gamble, you know, because it isn't a st I think you're wrong. Uh, Bitcoin is not a store of value because in order to be a store of value, you first have to start with value because you can't store something that you ha don't have. So they're both speculative tokens. And I guess to the extent that they both keep going up for the next few years, probably looking at the charts, uh, Ethereum is going to beat Bitcoin. So if I had to buy well, I have to sell as, a speculative, as, as a speculative <laughs> token, but I, I, I think, you know, I think if they go down, Ethereum is going to go down more, right? So if, I, if they crash, Ether will probably crash more too. Uh, you'd probably agree with that. Um, but... If if they're going to go up, and I'm going to I'm going to buy it and hope, um, then I guess I would I would I would take that one. But uh, you know, so you, again, take chances, you, know, you take huh? your chances on the bullet. But if the bullet wasn't good, <laughs> you would go for Ethereum. You might not be a good shot. It could be a it could be a you know a, you know it could be a you know it might not go off. Uh, I don't know. Right, guys, let me let me uh, throw something uh, out there. I, I, want, that I, think I want Raul's from collection. I want Kevin's watch collection, and I want. Peter's gold collection. I'll just sell you an <laughs> NFT. I just want everybody to know that. You have, you know, know. Expecting to get let me throw over. something out there on Ethereum. My agent told about. me that's what I was getting paid to do this show. So I'm just waiting. And by the way, Peter, if you don't want to give me your gold, you can transfer it into Ethereum and send it to me that way too. <laughs> guys, on Ethereum, let me ask a question I've noticed of late. My guys in our shop have been watching how slow it's getting on transactions. It's grinding slower and slower and slower. There's some problems here if we're going to be using this. Algorand. For, look, I'm, Algorand. I'm just saying for financial services, when I, when I transfer, if let's say I want to buy uh, Nestle or I want to buy uh, Roche in Swiss francs, okay, which I do in, in the index business, I want to be able to do a nanosecond transaction. And I don't want to wait because I'm doing the spot price of the stock. I'm trying to buy a block. Ethereum is getting really slow. Yeah, and, and I think I, I think that's right, Kevin. It's because it's incredibly popular, which is what's driving up the price. And there's a very, very restricted supply because everybody's staking for 2.0. Um, in addition, everyone's taking off the exchange. So there's about, I think, as of today, about 11% of all ETH available for supply. It's ridiculous. So we've got this massive um, supply restriction and exponential demand it's driving up price and, and making the system cloggy as well. I think the layer two is going to help. And then, in addition, it'll push things to other chains where they should be. I Not think it's going other chains. I think we're going other chains. I think it's going to be a vertical just for FX trading. I think there'll be a vertical for it. Makes sense. I, I think there's because I don't think Ethereum's the end. It's too. But listen, I was with a guy like yesterday. We were doing a transfer just on USDC. It it took 15 seconds. And now I mean, that may sound fast, but that is an eternity in FX trading. I mean, there's dirty words. You can use the word XRP, and everybody hates you for it. 
but it solves certain problems for certain types of transactions. And as you say, it's a multi-chain world and the interoperability between all these chains in due course will mean yeah. I will send you Canadian dollars there up at the lake and yeah. I will send it to you instantaneously and you won't care whether it's come across XRP, Agreed. Lightning. Agreed. If, you know what, Raul, if, if your problem is that you're too rich, crypto will solve that for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I also yeah, make you richer. Also You're right. We, we don't discount that ETH 2.0, uh, the transition from the old proof of work to proof of stake system will make Ethereum much, much, much quicker. I think that's the first part of the answer. And I think the second part of the answer is different chains will do different things. There are some industries where 15 seconds is not a long time. In fact, it's very, very quick. Like Peter's industry, for example, if you want to send gold around the world, and you want to send it in 15 seconds sounds like it's very, very, very fast. So I think different I, chains. Will I'm, be different I'm looking for a world where I can finally eradicate the FX trader that I've been dealing with for 30 years, <laughs> who has clipped me for four to six basis points every time I change currencies. Well, how they much do you get no, clipped when you? They add no value whatsoever. And I, I want them to shine shoes. That's their next <laughs> career. They have well, clipped so you're not, much. You're not me. trading crypto for free. No, People are making money off your crypto. I'm just that. telling you the future of all of this is to eradicate that waste and that friction and no value added. FX traders well, are single Bitcoin and sell Ether don't amoeba. do that. They are single cell amoeba. You find the FX yeah. traders at the bottom of the ocean. That's where they live. They're worse than lawyers. We got to get rid of and them. And you know, by the way, you don't, you can't, you, you can't. You can't transfer but your physical gold around the world. About you, Raul. You, you can't transfer your physical gold around the world instantaneously, but you can transfer title instantaneously. It's very easy if you have gold stored uh, with a third party to transfer your ownership to somebody else, and you can do it even quicker and less expensively than I can transfer my Bitcoin. And, and you I have believe, all these institutions. I believe the fee on that, Peter, with the Swiss banks is 200 basis points. I'm not giving anybody 200 basis points. Well, like you, there are a lot cheaper ways to do it than that. So your bankers, maybe you're ripping you off. But they're all when you ripping, talk, you, they're ripping you <laughs> off too. You just don't That's know. That's their job. But, but, but when you're talking about all these institutions that want to own Bitcoin through some intermediary like an like a ETF. Well, if you're going to do that, well, then you might as well own the gold ETF. The whole the selling point behind Bitcoin is you don't need a third party to store it. You don't have to pay to have your Bitcoin stored. But the minute you're trusting a third party and you're paying storage fees, you might as well trust something and store something that's real uh, like gold as opposed to something that's well, imaginary. What the like Canadians Bitcoin. solved for people that were at least on the hedge fund side and to stay compliant, they can buy the Canadian ETF. It costs them 40 basis points. They are completely tied to the volatility of Bitcoin. Bitcoin is held inside the Canadian ETF. It yes, on the but why would they? But that's very different than somebody who would want to buy gold because gold is yeah, stable most, and a store of value people. and Bitcoin is highly speculative. The way uh, gold is owned, I've owned gold for my years. 11, but promise, yeah, to invite me, promise to invite me back when Peter capitulates, okay? Uh, you guys got a long I, wait. I wish you guys, I wish you guys <laughs> great success. And Raul, I'm like Owen Wilson and Wedding Crashers. I'll be yeah. knocking on your door next week. Yeah, you know they're <laughs> filming. Re they're they're still filming. Not letting you in. Goddamn door, Raul. We're they're still filming. Not letting you in. They're filming Red Wedding Crashers too here in Puerto Rico. So All right, you see that? doing it right uh, now. Guys, <laughs> I wish you the best. Have a great weekend, guys. Thank you. Have a great weekend, guys. Love you. Right. I really enjoyed it. I want to do it again. I'm going to put all you guys on Shark Tank, and then I'm going to, I'm going to eviscerate you yeah. in front of the And audience. eventually, <laughs> Kevin, you're going to be back in my camp one day. I, look, I hope that we can have – I think Peter is a really important dialogue. I really enjoy the crap we do on Twitter. That's very interesting. I think the fact that it's a healthy debate is great. And I will tell you, and I think Mooch made reference to it, we all talk to institutions one way or another. We're all the same way. There's tremendous interest. And if you know that's coming – you might as well put a three to seven percent allocation and pick your own crypto assets. I'm I'm going to have probably seventeen of them by the end of next week. I well, you know, there's over eleven thousand to choose from. Let me tell you something you'll find interesting. It took me four months to get compliant on the FTX platform. Four months before the auditors, the regulator, and my own internal compliance checked the box. Can you imagine what happens when that finally gets streamlined? I'm now compliant on FTX. I can actually put out a portfolio and have my own external auditors and regulator and compliance department say, okay, we're all right with it. Four months, that's a long time. What's also amazing is how incredible FTX is, right? I mean, In incredible. 
And absolutely an unbelievable platform. Absolutely. Sam Bankman-Fried is a genius. That platform is insane. I said it's going to be bigger than Binance, and it's going to happen pretty soon. That, that's the way I see it. I, I've yeah. never met a guy like that. I, spoke, I had lunch with him in Bitcoin 2021. We were supposed to have half an hour together. I spent four hours with him. He's 29 years old. That's that crazy. guy's a phenom. There's no question about it. But, you know, I said to him, listen, I got to own a piece of it. You're private. Let me buy a piece. I mean, let me be part of the story. That was the beginning of our journey together. I'm very happy. I'm a shareholder now. I love that whole platform. But mostly because I can show it to an institution and say, you can be compliant on this. This platform has the infrastructure to actually do your reporting, your mark to market, your 1099, everything based on the jurisdiction you're trading in. That's what he did right. That was the genius that he had. Yeah. It was brilliant. Amazing guy. Yeah, Guys, listen, love you madly. We'll get you guys back on the show. You're all welcome back here. Thank you. Uh, it's been a great afternoon. We'll get you back here again separately together with a mix. Thank you, guys. Well, thank call. you. Take care, everybody. Take care, everyone. Bye -bye. Hey guys. Wow, 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 wow. What an amazing, amazing Friday banter. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. I will see you again in about half an hour when I am doing another Microdose show. So make sure you subscribe to Microdose. I'm going to be back in half an hour with a quick 10-minute Microdose of crypto content. No side effects. I'll see you guys again soon. Until then, trade well, my friends, and use the after banter hashtag to discuss anything you heard on the show. And share the show, the biggest banter we've ever had. See you guys again soon.